When I was a kid, my math teacher said to me, Derek, someday you're going to need this math. And when I became a math teacher, I found myself saying the same things to my students. Someday you're going to need this math. But that's not quite right, is it? You see, it's, it's less about how you're going to need it tomorrow, and more about how you're going to want it today, and not for some obscure real-world threat or some math test. The universe is passively speaking to you all the time. Sometimes the message is obvious. Don't wander into traffic. Don't put your hand on the stove. Don't eat the yellow snow. <laughs> but oftentimes the message is not obvious. In order to understand what it's saying, we learn things. These things can be grouped into professions. And as you get new professions, you can see the world through a different view. Want to learn how to get your mechanics classes? Work on some cars. Write a book? Get your writer's classes. Every single time you learn a new way of looking at the world, you get more agency, but you also recognize things you would have otherwise missed. A mathematician's glasses are unique for a couple of reasons. They're pretty challenging to get. When you sit through your math classes, the teachers tell you you're wrong often, and you have to go back and relearn stuff. Others seem to succeed effortlessly while you toil on nightly practices and assignments. Um, it can seem like there's no immediate application for what you're learning. If you learn a new technique in Kung Fu, you kind of know what it's for. But with math, it's hard to tie it to any one particular application. And in fact, it can feel disingenuous to do so because math is so broadly applicable, it's so abstract. But the payoff is awesome. That broad applicability means we can use math to understand virtually any phenomenon to which we can put numbers. I think that's awesome. It means that as a species, we can look into the distant stars and we can try to understand the subatomic particles within. We can talk about the rise of bridges and the fall of markets. We can talk about the distant past and the shining future. That's great, right? <laughs> well, yes, for the species, but as that chuckle just elicited, perhaps not for the individual. It, it's, a, it's, it's good enough sometimes to appreciate that something happened, that we were able to do something without necessarily knowing all the mathematics involved, in the same way that I was very happy that we took a picture of a black hole, even though I don't know the architecture of the telescopes involved. But we humans are a curious species. So often in our stories, we extol the virtues of adaptability and questioning. We dream, we create, and we question. And with mathematics, you can ask such wonderful questions. I taught high school for the better part of a decade, and I noticed there was a correlation between students being able to ask meaningful questions and their success. Sometimes a student would come to me and say, Mr. Taylor, I am very confused. I don't know what's going on. Can you help me? And it breaks your heart, because you want to help, and you can, but that's not a meaningful question in that the roles instantly reverse. The questioner is now the questioned. It's the teacher who has to start asking the probing questions, trying to figure out where the misconception is in their understanding. Um, my teacher would tell me, Derek, don't come to me and say, I am an empty vessel, fill me. Ask me a meaningful question. And I said the same thing to my own students. Meaningful questions help enrich our lives. Let me tell you a story. My wife and I recently stopped renting and bought a house. So, yay, we made it quote unquote. And there's a lot of exciting things about this. There's all sorts of stuff I'm going to learn how to do, like mowing the lawn, which I haven't done since I was 10. <laughs> but the thing is, there was one thing that I was super excited about, and it was not a small part of me either. I was finally going to be able to use all that math that I had learned. I got a master's degree in it, and this is like the one example that teachers trot out to their students. They say, you're going you're to buy a house, you're going to get a car. This was it, right? Finally, I can do something with this. Well, then I learned that there's a whole lot of rules of thumb that people use instead. Here's a couple. When you go to make your monthly budget, honestly account for what you're actually spending. Try to set aside a little money, just in case a rainy day comes, so that the disaster isn't so bad when it gets there. And it's worth it to quibble over the fine adjustments to your interest rate, because little adjustments here make a big long-term impact. Congratulations! You can now go and have a conversation with a banker. 
about getting a mortgage. I'm not saying I just summated everything for you. There's no way I can put together entire professions into just a couple of sentences. But I am saying that people have been walking into banks and getting mortgages with even less information than that since banks and mortgages. And that's kind of gotten us into trouble now and again. <laughs> the financial crisis of 2008, 7 and 8, yes, there were many reasons that that happened, but this is one of them. And again, I'm not saying you should be cynical and think everyone's out to get you or everyone's too incompetent to actually help you, but this is a great time to start asking questions. And as a mathematician, that's exactly what I did. So, if you have your financial glasses from either education or perhaps uh, you've bought a house before, you may know where I'm going with this. What I did was I, I started thinking to myself, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to make this work? The first, uh, actually, so here we go. Let's just make up an example. Imagine that after your down payment, you're going to need a loan for about $200,000 paid off over 30 years. And because you have to pay a bank more money than they lend you in the form of interest, we have that right here as 5% fixed, meaning it's not going to change over the course of the loan. Our first question might be then, can we afford this? And what I want to do is think about how that question is going to change as we progress through this. Can we afford this? So I put together a monthly budget. And if you can read it, it does say Rubik's Cube habit up there. I said, be honest, and this is me walking the walk, okay? <laughs> So we've got $1,300 for mortgage each month. Fantastic. What we need to know now is what is our monthly payment going to be? So that comes from this fellow here, the amortization formula. So this is something that if you have your mathematician's glasses, you can look at this and it will seem just as intimidating to them as everyone else, only we have some idea of how to think about it, we can break it down, and we can work with it. Turns out again that someone has done the heavy lifting for us because you can go to websites and punch in the numbers of your mortgage. And it will give you your monthly payment. In this case, it's about $1,073. So yes, we can afford it. And if we stopped there, we would be doing a disservice to ourselves, because there's actually more to this story. You see, this website also breaks down each individual payment you make into both principal and interest. The principal is the amount of money that you pay toward your loan. That helps you. The interest is the money the bank gets to keep. So you pay that money and it never comes back to you. And what I noticed here was that this loan, you're paying $240 towards your loan, but over three times that in interest. And so often we come to the conclusion, ah, well, I noticed that I had some extra money in my budget there. What if I paid some of that towards the principal? That's not a bad idea. So if we look at exactly how much we have, we have $226. I'm going to keep it simple and just call it 200 bucks. We're going to put that towards the principal. What happens? If you pay the loan off normally, after 30 years, you'll have paid about $186,000, give or take. And that's nearly the cost of the loan itself. That is a lot of money. But if you pay $200 with each individual monthly payment, now you're only paying $125,000 and it ends nine years early, meaning you save about $61,000. And that's fantastic. But again, if we stop here, we're doing a disservice to ourselves because maybe there's other questions we could ask. What else could I do with that $200 each month that might do better than just paying off the loan early? You see, you can invest it and maybe put it in bonds or the stock market or something, or I don't know, go to the gambling tables. Or, I don't know. Point is, <laughs> don't do that last one. Um, the point is that you could do something with that money and perhaps it might make more sense to do that than put it down towards your principal. So what I did to answer this question, <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to scare you guys. My brain space is pretty strange. But uh, what I did was I took apart that amortization formula, and I plugged it into a spreadsheet, and then I checked it against the online sources to make sure that my numbers weren't in too much of a disagreement, and it turns out they matched exactly. Good sign. Then I built a couple of columns representing some investment. And this investment was giving me some sort of rate of return, right? Now I got to my good, meaningful question, which was, at what percent of return does it make more sense to invest it there than to just pay off the loan early? That's a meaningful question, because it can tell you what to do next. It's actionable. You can do something with that question. So let's think about where we've been. 
We started with, can we afford it? We moved on to, should we pay extra towards principal? We moved on to, could we invest it? And then we moved on to a meaningful question, at what percent do we make enough money back to, for it to make more sense to invest than to put it towards principal? That's awesome. It turns out in this case, it's about 5%, give or take. But what buying a home makes up for in importance, it lacks in frequency. That is to say, you buy a car, you take out a line of credit, you go to college and you need to pay that off, you get a whatever. All these things are very important, but they're not a part of our daily lives in the same way that an alarm clock is. And to me, that day-to-day -day interaction with the way math influences my life is where I find a lot of my pleasure. For example, I was talking with a friend of mine, and it, he does a whole lot of things too. Um, we got to talking about juggling, and of course, I've got some tennis balls, and so they come out and we're juggling. Or more precisely, he's juggling and I'm picking up drop tennis balls. <laughs> and then the clubs come out, and we're juggling clubs, or he's juggling clubs, but then a thought flirts across my brain for just a split second. And that is, why does a tennis ball's path look so similar and yet so different from the path of a club? I mean, think about it. When you see someone juggling, you get these nice smooth arcs, right? And when you see someone juggling clubs, you get something very similar, but again, it's different. They have these nice swooping arcs with the tail end of them. So I got to thinking about that. What we did was we got a camera, and took a whole bunch of pictures, actually we just let the video run, and I turned it into a bunch of pictures and isolated the color. For this one, I, it was just a tennis ball being thrown, and you can see that nice smooth arc, but that's not what a club looks like. So what I did was I got a mallet. It's kind of like an extreme club, in the sense that you have a heavy one end, a light other end, and it will still give that big spinning motion. And what I did was I took some colored tape, and I painted a rainbow along the side of it. Then I took a video, of him throwing me this thing so that you can see exactly where each color goes. Then what I did was I took that video, isolated each color, and superimposed all the images I got so that I could see exactly where each color went. And it looks kind of neat, doesn't it? On the one hand, we have the orange side at the very far end where you see that nice smooth arc, just like we saw with the tennis ball. And you can go further along to the yellow, the green, the cyan, the blue, and then finally the purple, where you can see the little loop happen at the tail end of it. And if you look closely, you can even see where that color is exactly on the hammer by where it is at the very last frame. That's kind of cool. So I asked the question, well, what is that orange curve? Okay, well, it's a parabola, but what's a name, right? I wanted to ask a more meaningful question. How does that relate to the path of the tennis ball. If you'll notice, they look very similar. The thing, though, is that they're not exactly the same. How are they related? The shapes are totally different. Turns out that that's where its center of mass is. The center of mass, if you, if you can see in the very corner there, is about right there. So that's really interesting. And that was just one tiny little thought that I had that I just took a couple of minutes to explore. Okay, it took an afternoon, but still. <laughs> The point is, I could explore it and find out about it, and I think that's awesome. So what I'm showing you here is, and you, as you go through your day-to-day -day life, there's tons of things like this that you can just explore and try to figure out. Sometimes the results you get are kind of amusing. There's a game called Go. It's played on a 19 by 19 board. Technically, they have smaller ones, but the main game is right here. And the, it's kind of similar to chess in that it's one of those thinking games, but Really, the only similarities are you have white and black pieces, and the players take turns. Similarity kind of ends there. In broad strokes, what you do is you put pieces anywhere on the board you can go, and you're just trying to surround more territory than your opponent. Fine. There's details, but not important here. If you have your AI glasses, you might know where I'm going with this. In 2017, AlphaGo Master beat the world champion Kejia at Go, and this was a big deal. But why? I mean, we've had checkers weekly solved since 2017. Perfect play results in a draw. So what made Go so hard? Well, the thing is that there are a lot of games of Go that could possibly exist. Think about it. The first player can put a piece anywhere on the board. The board is 19 by 19, so that means you have 361 options for that first move. Then the second one, you have 360 options, because someone already went. 
and then 359, 358, 357, and so on. And every single time there's another set of choices, you multiply those numbers to figure out how many different games there are there. What that means is that we need some way of multiplying 361 by every number less than it. Now, this is not an exact accounting for how many different games there are. It's an approximation, but it can tell you the scale. Mathematicians have a way of doing this. It's called a factorial. No, the number's not being shouted at you. It's just 361. <laughs> Although that does make for some funny jokes in the classroom. So what that does is it will multiply 361 by every whole number, positive, less than it. The number you get, you might have seen this number before. <laughs> or you might not have. Uh, that's a big number. Now, I can't get my head around that, although it's really interesting to me that there's so many zeros at the end. This is the number written out in scientific notation, about 1.4 times 10 to the 768. You might think that's a reasonable number. I know what 768 is. If you give me a couple hours, I can count to it. But that's how many zeros that number has. To give you an idea of the scale of that number, that is 10,000 trillion, 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 Google, 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 Google games for every atom in the known universe. And that doesn't count the lion's share of games that ends on some number of moves other than 361. Now, do you need to know that in order to really appreciate what AlphaGo Master did, what we did by creating that AI that beat the master at Go? Well, not necessarily, but I can tell you that if you are able to do that, your appreciation is only enriched by it. I've given you an example from physics, from game theory, uh, from finance, and I've only scratched the surface of those professions. No profession is immune from the positive influence of understanding mathematics. Tomorrow, ask a question. Be aware of asking that question. Purposefully ask it. Don't worry about asking an original question because you are on your own journey, not somebody else's. Don't worry about asking a deep question because oftentimes the best questions are the simplest ones. But ask it. Pursue the answer. Follow the evidence where it leads. And I promise you that your life will be just a little bit richer because of it. Thank you.